So that's the title of my sermon. The title of my sermon is Trinity Confusion. So what I'm hoping to get out of this sermon is just to explain why there is confusion about this topic and why people who have, you know, seemingly contradictory positions, you know, they have absolutely, you know, polar opposite positions. When you listen to their sermons, it both sounds true, right? Because there's confusion about what the Trinity is and, and how to understand it. So that's the purpose of this sermon. The purpose of this sermon is to try and explain to you why there's confusion about the Trinity and why it's not as black and white as some people are making it to seem. You know, people that we know online and, and all that sort of stuff. So that's why I've called it Trinity Confusion. Hopefully it doesn't confuse you more, but it might. I'm hoping to try to shed light and make it a bit clearer, um, but really just showing you that it's not as black and white as we think it is. Now, this is really the, the, the main verse that most people go to when they talk about the Trinity in the Bible, when there's three that are one. 1 John 5, 7, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So that's, that's clear. You know, nobody disputes that that's what the Bible says. There are three, and that's one side of it, but it also says these three are one. Right? So that's what that verse says. There are three, and these three are one. So that's what it means, right? There's three, there are three, and these three are one. So three, I, I think that's a good way to represent the, the paradox of the Trinity, right? Three equals one. Now, this is a paradox, and this is not something that is fully comprehensible by us when it comes to God's nature. Neither is it something that's fully logical either, because when you look at that, I mean, is that a logical mathematical equation? No, but this is what the Bible teaches. And I just find it funny that, you know, with this whole controversy that's going on, people, are, people, like, people acknowledge that this is an illogical and incomprehensible concept. But then all of a sudden, now that this is a controversy, everyone's an expert on this. Everyone knows exactly what the nature of God is like. They know how to define it. They know the exact right words to use. And if you differ from them, then you're just a heretic. You're unsaved. You're a reprobate. In fact, you may even be a homosexual because you don't understand the Trinity. I mean, to me, that's just out completely outrageous. Um, and one thing I want to say is, you know, since starting this church, you know, since I started the church in Punchbowl three years ago, you know, my position on the Trinity has not changed at all. And I know people might think that it's been changing and I've been saying different things, and this is kind of like what I want to explain in this sermon. But my position on the Trinity has not changed at all. Now, have I grown in understanding on how they are three and how they are one? Yeah, of course. Because there's a lot of discussion about how they're three and how they're one. So I'm, I'm growing in understanding how they're three and how they're one. But have I changed in how I understand the Trinity and the fact that it's a paradox that there are three and these three are one? No. I've always held the same position. I've always understood the Trinity as a paradox. You know, and it was something like before I always struggled with. It was like, well, are they three? Are they one? You know, you'd be preaching to Muslims. They're saying you believe in three gods. You know, you're preaching to other people. They're, they're saying that they're not all one, you know. But for me, this is, this is how I kind of settled it in my heart. The Bible said there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And to me, that was enough, you know, because it was like, okay, I know there's three, and I know there's one, and I don't know how these actually hang together, but the Bible says the three, there are three and these three are one, and that was good enough for me. Like that was, to me, I always understood 1 John 5, 7 as the glue that held these two concepts that I couldn't fully grasp together, right? That was like the equal sign in this equation. Now, that's how I've always understood it. And this is why, you know, maybe people don't understand when I preach things, you know, I get accused of, you know, people are saying I'm slipping into oneness. But I haven't actually changed what I believe. I've always understood, like I said, that the, the, the Bible teaches there are three persons within the Godhead, but they were also one person. I just didn't know how it hung together. Um, and the reason why people are thinking that I'm slipping into oneness is because now I just understand it a bit more, and because people are trying to push the three, I'm trying to explain to you, I, I also believe that they're one. And obviously, like in any situation, I always liken debate like a divorce. Right? Or when couples have problems. Right? Couples have problems, they come to me. Right? And then you know, the wife's you know, trying to say, oh, this her husband's doing this. And I try and say, yeah, well, maybe you should do this. And, and, and she just thinks, I'm, I'm, oh, you're on my husband's side and things like that. It's the same on the other. So it's the same with this. You know, when you're talking to somebody who's emphasizing the three and you kind of go, yeah, but they're one as well, they accuse you of oneness. And then you, you talk to the people that are like oneness and you say, no, 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 hey, wait, they're three. They're saying, oh, well, you're polytheistic. But it's, no, no, it's because it's both are there. They're both true. 
Now, maybe another reason why people are getting that impression, because the one thing that has changed since this issue came up is what I say when I baptize. Now, I acknowledge that is something that was different. You can go back and look at the early baptisms in our church, and I was saying Father, Son, Holy Ghost, because that's how I understood it. And then being challenged on that, I don't believe the scriptural support for that position is as strong. I don't think it's that big of a difference, to be, to be honest. And, and it has nothing to do with my position on the Trinity. You know, like I said in that sermon, you can believe in an orthodox three persons, one essence trinity and still believe Jesus has the authority of all three persons in the Godhead and that's why you baptize by his name. So yes, that did change. You know, I, do, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say that I understand everything and I know all mysteries, right? But you know, I, I obviously have been corrected on some things and have changed my positions along the way. So that's how I've always understood the trinity. You know, I don't like it when people say I'm slipping into oneness because my position has not changed. I just understand how they're one more and I understand how they're three more. Yes, did I change what I say when I baptize? Yes, I did. Did it have anything to do with my position on the Trinity? No. Um, and, you know, I didn't think, you know, before I started this church and talking to people about the Trinity, hearing sermons about the Trinity, you know, because people would obviously come to Lighthouse Baptist Church, preach on Jesus being God, preach on the Trinity. I remember listening to a lot of um, Keith Piper's sermons and he would allude to the three R one when he would talk about the deity of Jesus Christ. And, and back then, like I said, I, I, it was a paradoxical concept to me. I didn't know exactly how it all hung together. I knew both truths were there. Um, but I honestly didn't think people made a big issue out of how they were understood. And this is why when people argue over the right terminology to say to the three and say to the one, to me it's like, well, I don't get what the big deal is. We, we kind of agree on the main concepts of what they are and the three are there and we're not denying the deity of Christ. We're not denying that there are three. You know, I, I didn't see it as a huge issue because I, I, I thought, hey, nobody really comprehends this fully. Even the people who are Orthodox Trinitarians and are separating from each other, you pin them down, they even say they don't fully comprehend these things, right? So that's how I've always seen it. <clears throat> now, I will say this, there are three and there, and there are one, but I do, I do think that if you go, fur going, going too far the three way is more dangerous than going too far the one way. That's what I think. You know, if somebody's going to go to an extreme, going the three way I think is worse than going the one way. Why? Because when you go too far in the three direction, either, either you start saying Jesus isn't God, which is what the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses do, or you have polytheism, right? Because if they're not one at all, and you go too far in the three direction, you have Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, God, Father, God, because that's three gods if they're not one, right? So if you go too far in that direction, you, have a, you either have polytheism or you have a, a Jesus that's not God. But if you go too far in the one direction, at least you still have a Jesus that is God, right? Because if some, even if somebody believes in modalism, which I don't believe, and I believe is false because I don't believe that he can only be one thing at one time, but at least they can justify that Jesus was the God that changed into that mode, right? So at least they have a, God, a Jesus that is deity. But when you go too far the three way, you can have a Jesus that is not deity. And that's why we have a problem with Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, because they acknowledge Jesus, and this is what James White always pins them down on, right? It's like, if Jesus isn't God, you know, why are people praying to him? Why are people worshipping him? You know, it's, it's like, you, you can't get away from the fact if you deny that Jesus is God, then you have idolatry happening, right? Because people are treating him like God. And if he's not the true God, is, it, is there two gods? You know, are they, are they committing idolatry? Things like that. So going too far the three way, I believe, is worse than going too far the one way. Now, both sides are true and present. I want you to hear me very clearly, like both sides are true. Is there only three? No. Is there only one? No. Why? Because there are three that are one. So this is what the truth is, both sides. This is not what's true. I don't believe that there are only three. Neither do I believe there's only one, right? This is what's true. Three equals one. So both, they're both sides are there. They're not only three. They're not only one. But people will say, well, well I've, heard, I've heard you preach that they're only one. That's because, that's because there is, the one's there. Or people will say, like, well, I've heard you preach that they're three, and uh, you know, there's only three, but you haven't preached that they're one. Well, it's because that's there too. But that's, not, that's, not what I, but that's why there was two sermons, right? There was the sermon where I preached, these three are one, and I preached a sermon, there are three. Because what do I actually believe? Three equals one, right? I believe both. So people try and 
accuse you of this. You know, you talk about the one. You're a oneness, modalist. You know, you preach about the three. Oh, you're a polytheist. And it's like, well, that's because what I actually believe is this. They're both true. There's, 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 it's a, that paradox there of the Trinity where there are three and these three are one. And this is why, this is why you have to understand. This is why there's confusion. Because when you hear a sermon on the three, it sounds great. It's scriptural. It's all that. Why? Because it's half true. Right? Because there's three. And then you hear a sermon. You know, so you, you hear a sermon from Stephen Anderson, for example, and you're like, hey, that, that makes sense. And it's like, yeah, maybe, maybe Tyler is a heretic. And then you hear Tyler's sermon, and you're like, wait a second, that sounds good as well. You know, maybe Stephen Anderson's a heretic now. And it's like, you get tossed to and fro. You've got to understand, guys, it's because they're both true. And if somebody's just preaching one side of the truth from the Bible, it's going to sound good because it is true. And if somebody's preaching one, the oneness of God, it's going to sound good as well because it's both true, because this is what is actually true. Not this, not this, this is true. All right? So I hope you, you get that concept and why you're starting to realize why people, when they talk, they're getting confused. And they hear two sermons that are seemingly opposite, but they both sound biblical, right? Or you're talking to somebody and people are accusing somebody of modalism, they're accusing somebody of polytheism because they're both preaching what I believe is a half side, one side of what is actually true, is that three equals one. Now, people, they're going to disagree over the right terminology on what these three and what these one are. And this is where now the lines, being, lines are being drawn, right? It's like, well, what, what are you going to call them? And, and that sort of thing. So the three, somebody might say, well, actually, they're three persons. Somebody might say they're three natures. And then when it comes to the one, somebody might go, well, they're just one in essence. But somebody else might go, well, they're actually one in person, right? So some people take that view, right? So this would be the, the Stephen Anderson view, the Orthodox Trinity view, persons, well, three persons are one essence. And here's the Tyler Baker view, right? One person, three natures. Now, I believe there are, there's a bit of truth from each of those, right? Because I don't believe Stephen Anderson is completely right and the Orthodox Trinity is completely right. Neither do I believe Tyler Baker is completely right. So this is why my position is, is a bit of both of this, right? Where it's, I believe there's one person on one side, but there's also three persons. And this is very similar to what Roger Jimenez preached. Now, it's funny, and I, I, didn't, I didn't even know that Roger Jimenez was going to preach that sermon when he preached it. Remember, because I preached my sermon first, right? And then when I listened to his sermon, you know what my thought was? Man, I, I agree with this, you know? And then all of a sudden, my sermon's different. You know, so I, I, I didn't know my sermon was different because when I heard his sermon, I liked it. You know, three persons are one person at the same time. But one thing I want to ask you is, you know, so there, there, I believe there's elements of both that are true. That's why I take that view. But one thing I want you to think about is, is, is it really that different? Because when I talk to the people that believe three persons, they say, well, are they coexist? Or three natures, for example. I ask you, are they, do they coexist? Yeah, they do. Father, Word, Holy Ghost coexist. Are they co-eternal? Yeah. Father, Word, Holy Ghost is co-eternal. Can they refer to themselves as we and us? Yeah, because Genesis 1.26 says, let us make man in our image. Who's the us? You ask them? Father, Word, Holy Ghost. So it's like, hmm, all right, because that's what I say. <laughs> but you're saying the same thing, but aren't you meant to be a heretic? So, and then you go to the one, and you say, well, okay, you believe, I believe they're one person, but the Orthodox Trinity says, well, they're one in essence. And I say, well, can that essence say that he's an I, and that thou, and there's one God? And they go, yeah. So I say, so I don't get what's the difference between this essence and this person, because if, if your essence is a person, by, by how you identify them, I, I don't know, I just, I don't know, what, maybe, there, maybe there's something I don't understand, you know, maybe they're ma making it different or something like that, but that's how I see it. I, I don't, that's why I don't see it as that different. You know, people are wondering, you know, why if I believe the same thing as Roger Jimenez, am I not, you know, labeling these guys as heretics? Because I don't see them as that different, because I understand what they mean by the three natures. And when I ask them, how do these three natures, what, what are their attributes? They're so similar to the attributes that I would give persons. They just refuse to use the word person, because they don't want to, they don't agree that the wheels conflict. They don't agree that, that they have totally separate bodies and all these other, there's all these other stuff that comes with the, with the definition of persons. And this is why people are, are disagreeing. I don't see it as really that different. Like I said in my video about Logan, I see it as it's in this realm of the same mystery, which is there are three that are one. And how do they hang together? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. So three equals one, right? We've established that both are true. 
This is what I'm trying to emphasize in this sermon, right? That there, there, there are two things that are happening here. Now, the fact that God is three, that is a milk of the word. I don't know if you can see that. I used a light blue. But... So milk of the word, light blue, it reminded me of dairy, you know, when you go, they still make the blue, the blue milk cartons? Okay. So um, that's a milk of the word. No doubt about that. You know, there are three, there's a, there are three, it's a milk of the word. You know what else is a milk of the word? That God is one. You know, so, you know, like I can show you multi scores of verses that say there are three, I can show you scores of verses where God is one, right? But you know what the meat of the word is? Right, it's the equal sign. It's how does the three equal one? Now, this, this, is, this is what's tough. This is what people don't know, right? So, this is how it looks. Three is milk, easy. Lots of verses, plenty of verses showing that there's a distinction. But you can't, you can't forget that we only believe in one God, right. right? So there's only one God. That's a milk of the word because all through the Bible, it's preaching against polytheism, right? There's one God that we worship. That is I, me, thou, right? But what everyone is disagreeing over and what people are trying to figure out is how do these two milk concepts hang together? And this is what the meat of the word is. This is what, and, and if people are, splitting and disfellowshipping over the meat of the word, you know, that, that's, a, that's a problem, right? Because, you know, this is, this is not as simple as it seems. So let's look at a few verses that are milk. I'll, I'll just spend a little bit of time on the milk and then we're going to get into the meat, right? The meat, meat of this issue. So this, this is our milk on the three side. Matthew 28, 19. This is where we can see clear distinctions between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, as we saw. I mean, John, uh, 1 John 5, 7 is one, right? There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, but it also says these three are one. So this is one that contains both the milk and alludes to the meat. Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. So I don't think it's necessarily wrong to refer to the three persons within the Trinity as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So they're not just the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, why would it be mentioned here? I guess people can make the argument, was well, by this time the Son was manifest, and that's why from then onwards it's referred to as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I don't necessarily have a problem with that argument. But what I'm saying here is there's a, there's a clear three persons being mentioned here. 2 Corinthians 13.4 is another clear mention that there are three separate persons. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, people would understand that as God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. What's another one? When we go to Jesus' baptism in Luke 3. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying the heaven was open. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove. So we have the Son being baptized, right? Holy Ghost descending in a bodily shape like a dove. And a voice came from heaven which said, which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. So that's the Father, right? Saying, this is my beloved Son. Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. So I could show you many other scriptures, right? Many other scriptures that, that talk about this. You know, here's some that, uh, that have been alluded to. Philippians 1, 2. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And people will say, see, clear distinction with Jesus being distinguished from God the Father because it says God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. But, it, but it's, always, it's not always that simple, guys. This is, this is the point of this sermon, that it's not always that clear cut because look at 1 Thessalonians 3, 1. You see, now God himself and our Father. So... Is the Father separate from God just because they're distinguished, different? You know, you say like, well, the Father, it's clear, but he's separate from God, right? Because it says God and our Father, you know, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. Or is it because, you know, is it because God can also be the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ? Because you wouldn't say that there's God and the Father and Jesus, you know, unless you say, well, that's referring to the Holy Ghost. You know, maybe that's one way to explain it. But there are passages like that too. When you look at God, our Father, uh, God... And our Father, it's not always God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's God and the Father. So are these two different people now too, just because they're mentioned separately? So it's not always that simple. Remember, three equals one. We always go back to this. Now let's look at some milk of the word with one. And I'm just showing you a couple of examples, right? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Mark 12, 29. This is Jesus quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4. Jesus answered him. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Psalms 89, 18, For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy Three of Israel? No, the Holy One of Israel, right? 
He's our king. Right? If you think about king of kings, Lord of lords. Look at Isaiah 44. Thus saith the Lord, the king of Israel, right? Because there's a king of kings, and his redeemer, who's that? The, we understand that as Jesus Christ, right? The Lord of hosts. I am the first and I am the last. Does that sound familiar? It's Jesus Christ in Revelation, the first and the last. He says, beside me, there is no God. But would an Orthodox Trinitarian say there isn't a God beside the Son, Jesus Christ? No, because they also believe the Holy Ghost and they also believe in the Father, right? But this is here, the Redeemer, the first and the last, saying beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Is there a God beside the first and the last, the Redeemer? Yea, there is no God. I know not of any. But an Orthodox Trinitarian knows one other than them, right? They, they know the Father and the Holy Ghost other than them. But why? Because these three are one, too. So that's why it's not multiple gods. It's one God. But the Redeemer, the first and the last, is the only God that exists, right? So, somebody... Like I said, the, the, there's three that equal one. I'm just trying to remember. I put these slides together, but I can't remember what I wanted to talk about. So somebody, oh, that's what I was going to say. So we have milk, right? Three is milk, one is milk. We haven't got into the meat yet. Now, if, some, if I just kept going, if I just kept laboring the point of milk of three and just showed you verse after verse after verse after verse of the three, right? And, and this is basically what I'm saying, right? That the milk is there. Does that get rid of that? No, right? What if I just belabored that point? One God, one Holy One of Israel, only one God. Don't have no other gods before me. I'm the only one God. I just went to every verse in the Bible. One, one, one. Does that get rid of the three? No. no. Right? And what if I said to you, well, guys, this is milk. Don't you get it? You're so stupid. Yeah. Just milk. Don't you see there's one God? And somebody says here, three. It's milk. You guys are idiots. Why do you think they're just one? It's because it's they're both true. Three equals one. This, this is what's true, right? So it's, you, 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 you don't debunk three by just showing verses that they're one. And you can't debunk three. Uh, three but, uh, yeah, you, you get what I'm saying, right? I'm getting confused now. So that's why I said it's called Trinity Confusion. So three, so the meat, the meat is the equal sign. The meat is how do they join together? So let's, let's get into some of the meat now. Because when we get into the meat, these are the verses that people are, are trying to talk about. This is what, where the discussion is really at. And people that are just like hard down the line, these are the ones they can't explain, right? So let's, let's talk about the meat, how they're three. So this is the first one I'll go over. And this is probably the, the controversial one that started it all, right? Is the son the father? Now people, you know, people tell me that there's no clear verses. You know, it's not just... It's not just some people that tell me. There's other people that tell me this too, right? So it's, I'm not just talking about anyone in particular. Now people tell me, hey, there's no clear verses in the Bible, you know, that the Son is the Father. But I, th I thought Isaiah 9, 6 was pretty clear. You know, when, when I, you know, I would tell this to Jehovah's Witnesses all the time. Like I said, I've heard people from the new IFB movement preach it. It's only recently they're starting to reinterpret Isaiah 9, 6, trying to come up with other ways. To me, it's hard to get around this one. It says, for unto us a child is born, Unto us a son is given. Now we know this is the word made flesh, this son. This is that man that was given to us, the child that's born, the son that's given. The government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God. So you have underlined the because this is what they're all trying to ignore now. The Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, this is a verse that's saying that the name of that son is the Everlasting Father. And people say, well, you know, all the explanations I'm hearing now are, well, it's because he's just another Everlasting Father somehow. But that's not what that passage says. That passage says he's the Everlasting Father. And if, they guess, if they're just going to make him another Everlasting Father, they're not making him just another God, right? He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. Is there another prince of peace? We've always understood Jesus as the prince of peace. Nobody would dispute that. He's the prince of peace. Why? Because of this passage. And he's the everlasting father. I mean, to me, that, that's, that's clear as day to me. Um, but somebody might say, 
you know, well, you know, it's just because he's like a father to us, so he's like another everlasting father, or he just came in the father's name, and therefore he's like another everlasting father. But that's not what the passage says. The, the, the name he's given is the everlasting father. There is one everlasting father. There's one God and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So if there's another everlasting father, who is it? You know, because there's only one father according to Ephesians 4. Um, so the other thing is that somebody might say, well, you know, he's the everlasting father, he's the mighty God, because he's God. And that's why, you know, he's, he's called the everlasting father. But I thought that was my argument. Like, my argument, that, that's, that's my argument. Like, my argument is that, yeah, because he's one, because there's one God, that's why Jesus Christ is the father, because there's only one God. So on the one side, they're the same person. On the three side, they're separate. So there's the son and the father. But on the one side, the son is the father. So if somebody says, well, he can be called the everlasting father because he's God, and there's one God, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying because they're both that one God. That's why he's the everlasting father. So to me, that doesn't really explain away this verse. It just it reinforces what I understand about this verse, which is that the son that is born, which is the, the second person in the Trinity, is referred to as the everlasting father, who's the first person in the Trinity. And that's why I believe the son is the father. That's a clear scripture, I believe. First John 3, I believe, is another clear scripture. So I posted this in the Facebook group. So if you guys are in the Facebook group, you would have saw this. But this is one I, I, I've actually preached on before at Lighthouse Baptist Church. I forgot. But I've actually preached on this before at Lighthouse Baptist Church, proving the deity of Christ. Because I was showing that, hey, the person that was manifested was the Father, in this, according to this passage. First John 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Right? So what's the subject there? It's the Father. Therefore the world knoweth, knoweth us not, who? The ones that are called the sons of God, because it knew him not. So who doesn't the world know? The Father. Right? Beloved, now we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, the sons of God, but we know that when he shall appear, who's the he? The Father. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Who's the him and the he? It's referring back to the Father in verse 1. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgress transgression of the law. And ye know, look at this, he, who? The Father. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Now to me, that's pretty clear that the Bible's saying that the Father was manifested to take away our sin. Now, does that mean I believe that the Word wasn't manifested to take away our sin? No. Because like I said, just because I show you that they're one, that doesn't mean I don't believe that they're three, because they're both true. We're talking about how these two concepts come together. How does this equal sign work? And people think they got it all figured out, and then you come across a passage like Isaiah 9, 6 or 1 John 3, and you're thinking, hey, that's, that's saying the Father was manifested in the flesh. So... How does that equal sign work? Well, this is what we're talking about, right? This is the meat that we're talking about. Let's keep going. Let's compare this, because it says here, the Father, he was in the world, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. If you look up knew him not, that's very similar to first, uh, into John 1, where it's talking about Jesus Christ coming in. And look what it says, it says, that was the true light. I just want you to note that, because I'm going to go into that in a moment. That was the true light. Who's the true light? Jesus. Right? Because he's the word made flesh and he's saying, you know, John the Baptist is preaching about the light and he's saying that was the true light. Jesus Christ was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. So this is what it's saying here about the Father because it knew him not, the Father. The Father was manifested, but it's also saying the Son obviously was manifested. The word was manifest in the flesh. He was the true light and the world knew him not. Now you say, well, Jesus is the true light. Now if he's the true light, then what does that make God? If, if God the Father is light as well, I mean, is there, are there two lights now? Or is it the one true light that is both the God, God the Father and God the Son? Because the three are one. Well, look at this. If Jesus here in John 1, 9 is the true light, look at this. Because people will say, because this is how they're trying to explain 1 Timothy 6 now, right? Because 1 Timothy 6 is all of a sudden the light is who no man can see, and can't, uh, has seen nor can see. And they say, well, that's God the Father because God is light. Well, let's go to that passage. God, God is light. 1 John 1, 5 says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. 
and in him is no darkness at all. Now, I do believe that God that it's talking about, that is light, is the Father. But remember, it said Jesus is that true light, right? So are, are, there, are there two lights now? Or is it because the three are one, there's one light, and Jesus and the Father are both that light in the one side, but then they're also, you know, I guess you say it's two lights on the three side, right? But because we don't only believe that, because the three are one, we're not polytheists, right? We're not, um, um, yeah, polytheists. It says here, if we say that we have fellowship with him, so who? The, the God that is light. And walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, look at this, as he is in the light. Now, wait a second. Because I thought, I thought the him, I thought God was light. But now he's in the light. So is he the light? Or is he, is, it the he, is he the one that's in the light? Because he's saying we have fellowship with him, but if we walk in the light, which is God, as he is in the light, so he's not just the light, he's also in the light, right? We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So the reason why I'm underlining it there is because it does distinguish God and Jesus Christ, who's the son of that God, right? So it's obviously talking about God the Father. But the God the Father is light. He's also in the light. But Jesus Christ is also that true light. Now, do you see now why I'm saying it's a bit of meat, that that equal sign? Because it's, it's not as clear-cut as people are making it out to be. Let's go, let's go further. Revelation 21, 22. And I saw no temple there. And it's talking about in heaven now. For the Lord God Almighty are the, and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city hath no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it. Right? So the light of God that I guess he's in, when we talk about here, he is in the light. That's his glory that's coming out. Did lighten it. Look at this. And the Lamb is the light thereof. So Jesus Christ is the true light. But God is light, God the Father. The God the Father is dwelling in the light. And guess what the light is that is shining off him? It's the Lamb, who is that true light. So is it as clear cut as there's just three and there's just one? No, no, there's three and there's one. And somehow they come together. And that's why I take the position that I do, because I see both there. Whereas I see there, yes, God is light. Jesus is light. Jesus is the light that is coming off God the Father, and God the Father is the one that's dwelling in the light that he is. Mind blown, right? And look at this, this is Acts 7. This is when Stephen looks up to heaven, right? Being, he, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. He saw the glory of God. That's the light of God, right? So that's the lamb he's looking at, according to, to, to Revelation, because the light coming off is the lamb thereof. But that's also God is light. He's the, he is, God the Father is the light as well as the one dwelling in the light. He looks up, he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So not only is Jesus the light coming off God, but he's also standing next to God. That's what he sees. And said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So do I believe Jesus is the Father? Yes, on the one side. Do I believe he's not the Father? At the same time, yes, because on the three side, you know, he's the son. So how does that work? Um, that's what we're trying to figure out, right? That's what the meat is. That's what the equal side is. We're trying to figure out how, how do these concepts hang together? You know, I don't think it's as clear cut as people think it is. Let's go on to 1 Timothy 6, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 1 Timothy 6, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> so you're probably hearing this uh, passage being debated about online. And really, uh, it seems like the, the Stephen Anderson position right now is, it, it's interesting because it started out as it was the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So he was saying that, you know, the, the light is what no man can see nor can see. But now he's saying, no, 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 it's not talking about the light. Now it's talking about the King of kings and Lord of lords, who is God the Father 
and that's who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach on, whom no man hath seen nor can see. And what was interesting about that video, because I think his first video where he said it was the light, he was saying that if you don't understand that, you're not saved. And then his next response was that now it's the Father. So he's changed his view there. So I'm just going to address first, let's say, like, let's say the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is God the Father. I guess there is a case for that in the sense that you could go to Deuteronomy 10, 17, and you can see in the Old Testament, Jehovah God, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor taketh reward. But why I think that's a weak argument is because you don't really know, because we, we believe that the Lord Jehovah is also Jesus. Nobody disputes that, that Jesus also is Jehovah. Now, do we have two Jehovahs? No, I don't think so. I think there's one Jehovah. Jesus is that Jehovah because on the one side, they're the same. Um, doesn't mean I don't believe there's the three. But you could say, okay, well, if that's God the Father, then God the Father is also referred to as the God of God and the Lord of Lords. But the problem is, is that in Revelation, Revelation makes it very clear that Jesus Christ, the Lamb, is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Look at here, Revelation 17, 14. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So here's a question for you. If God the Father is God of gods, Lord of lords, he's king of kings, doesn't that mean he's all the way at the top? Right? But if Jesus Christ is king of kings and Lord of lords too, how do you have two people that are king singular of kings and lord singular of lords when there's two of them up there and they're not one? So somehow these two are one. Like the Trinity teaches, right? There are three that are one. But if somebody just tries to interpret these passages as there are only three, then you're left with two people that are King of Kings and Lord of Lords, right? So to me, that, that, that doesn't make sense. You can't have, it's like when the verse says, you know, he's, he's the only potentate. You know, if Jesus is o the only saviour, then, then who's God the Father? He's the saviour too. Now you've got two saviours. So they must be one. They must come together somehow, just like they must be potentate, king of kings, lord of lords. Now what's interesting about this passage is this passage actually teaches that Jesus Christ, because the way they would have to explain this is it's the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when Jesus Christ appears, he's going to show who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. And they'll say, that's God the Father who only has immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach it, whom no man hath seen nor can see. So nobody can see, nobody hath seen the Father, but Jesus Christ, when he comes, he's going to reveal who that King of Kings and Lord of Lords is. You see how that's what it's saying? And they're trying to say that's God the Father. But what's interesting about this is if you go to Revelation 19, where Jesus actually appears, this is the appearing of Jesus Christ, when he's coming in the clouds, guess who's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords that he's revealing? And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. But he, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So this is a man that is coming, and we know it's Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was the Word made flesh. It's called the Word of God. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Right? That, and hey, that's the word of God too, right? The two-edged sword that's coming out of the word of God's mouth. Where did I come from? And that, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. And he hath, a, he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So... Remember, we're talking about the meat. So I'm not trying to prove that there's only one. I'm not trying to prove that there's three. I'm just saying, hey, somehow these come together. And 1 Timothy 6 is saying, Jesus Christ is going to show somebody who's the King of kings and Lord of lords, whom no man hath seen nor can see. And then we look in Revelation and the King of kings and Lord of lords that he shows is him. So how does that work? Right? Uh, let's look back here at 1 Timothy 6 because I want to address because the other explanation that somebody came up with and, and Stephen Anderson was kind of holding on to that for a bit. Uh, another guy was Jason Robinson. So he's another uh, preacher within the New IFB movement. So he's holding on to the view that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is Jesus, right? Because it's obvious from Revelation that that's Jesus. 
But now he's making the case, well, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, and then whom the no man hath seen nor can see is the light. Right? And they're saying the light, that's God the Father. That's who no man hath seen nor can see. That's what uh, Jesus is dwelling in, and Jesus is the King of kings, Lord of lords, who only hath immortality. Now, we already talked about the light, and that's already a bit confusing, right? Because, you know, if the light is God the Father, but then, remember, Jesus is the light that is shining. Another thing that doesn't make sense is, how do you, ha how do you have a light that no man can see? Because then how do you even know it's light? Right? If, if, the, the reason why no man can approach unto God and no man can look at his face, it's because of the light. Because the light is blinding, right? The, bl the, the, the brightness of the light is what makes it that you can't see the one dwelling in the light. But if you can't see the light, how is it blinding you? You're going to be able to see who's dwelling in the light because you're not seeing the light that's coming off him to be able to not see him. Does that make sense? You have, to, you have to be able to see light to know that light's there. Otherwise, if you can't see it, it doesn't make sense. They're just saying that because they want that to be God the Father. So that already doesn't make sense. If it's a light, it makes sense if it's a light that no man can approach unto. But if you can't see it, nor can you see it, then you should be able to approach unto that light because it's the light that makes it hard to approach unto. But let's say, let's say we give it to them, right? Let's say the light, okay, the light's the Father. You can't approach him, you can't see him. But they accept that the only potentate, and remember only, king of kings, singular king of kings, lord of lords, that's, that's another issue too, is Jesus. So let's say they say that's Jesus, right? The whom is referring to the light, but the who is referring to Jesus. Does that make sense? Who? So they say that this whom is different. This refers to the direct object, which is the light. But they say the who refers to the subject, which is the only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. So they allow that this, who only hath immortality, applies to Jesus Christ. So, okay, let's give it that, right? Who only hath immortality applies to Jesus Christ. Let's look at some passages which talk about a God that's immortal, right? If he's the only one that has immortality, that's already a problem because God the Father has immortality. Holy Spirit has immortality too. If they're completely separate. But they're saying Jesus Christ, he's the only, who only hath immortality. Now, if you read in 1 Timothy 1.17, it says, Now unto the king eternal, that makes sense, right? King of kings. Immortal, but look at this, invisible. The only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So the immortal king eternal, who is the only wise God, guess what else he is? Invisible. But if Jesus is the only potentate, the king of kings, lord of lords, who only hath immortality, then do we now have... Two people that are invisible, two people that are immortal, even though, you know, there's only one that is immortal. Jude 1, it says here, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. So uh, this is why you, you study this out and you just keep going deep down this rabbit hole because, like I said, this equal sign, three equals one, it is strong meat, right? Now look at this. So you go from, you, if you look up in the Bible, the only wise God, so you have only have immortality, you find a king eternal, he's immortal, invisible, the only wise God. You look up where else is the only wise God, you get to Jude. This only wise God is the one that is keeping you from falling and presenting you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Now, who's the one presenting you before his presence with exceeding joy? Well, let's look at 2 Corinthians 4.14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. Now, wait a second. If the King of kings and Lord of lords who only have immortality is Jesus, then the King eternal, immortal, invisible, God only wise is Jesus. But the only wise God is the one presenting you faultless before the presence of his glory. And then you have God the Father, who's the one raised up the Lord Jesus and raised up also by Jesus. He's going to present us with you. And then you have Colossians 1.20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, Jesus, right, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, who? Jesus, in the body of his flesh through death. Why? To present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. So is it God the Father's sight? 
Is God the Father doing that? Or is Jesus presenting you faultless before his sight? So there's, there's two there, but remember, there's two, there's three, and there's one as well. So how does this meat hang together? How does this equal sign hang together? You know, is it just, is it just black and white like that? <clears throat> Let's go on to, you know, the only wise God, our Saviour. This is another one where it's figuring out how this meat hangs together. Isaiah 50, 43. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen. So this only wise God is the Saviour, right? That ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So it sounds like that's this one person talking, right? Because he's saying there's nobody else. I even, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no saviour. So very clear that there's one saviour, there's one God, right? That's a milk of the word. But let's compare that to Romans 16, 23, which is another verse that talks about the only wise God. It says, to God only wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now, if I just take the logic that, hey, this is milk, guys. Look, can't you tell that Jesus Christ is separate from God only wise? You know, there's a distinction here. Yeah, amen and amen, because there's three. But they're also still one because that only wise God is our saviour. There is no saviour beside him and yet he's being distinguished, the God only wise, from Jesus Christ. Because there are three that equal one, right? They're, they're, both concepts are true. That's what I'm trying to drive forward. So you see how we got milk and there's milk that are three, Jesus Christ and the only wise God. But there's also one God and the meat is how are these hanging together? I hope you're starting to get this idea that it's not as clear-cut as, as people are making it out to be, right? So what's, what's, what's some things I'm bringing up, right? So people talk about, so how do, how do we interpret these verses? This is what people are, people are disagreeing over. So we, we talk about, well, how many fathers are there? We talk about Jesus being the everlasting father. But people that only accept the three side, like this is how they interpret the Trinity, you'll say, okay, well, there's, there's the God the Father, and then there's the everlasting father. And because they're trying to cram it into the three, they're like, oh, there's two fathers, right? <laughs> because it's like, because it can't be just, Jesus can't be the father. So it's like, okay, two, and it's like, okay you, got, you got God the father is the savior, Jesus is the savior. And it's like, oh, no, there's two saviors. Now there's two saviors now. God's the light, Jesus is the light. That's because they're both the light. You know what I mean? Jesus has white hair in Revelation. God has right where, white hair in Daniel. Oh, it's because they both have white hair. It's like, well, how many, it's because, is it just like every time we've got to interpret it on that side of the equation? Why can't I just say, well, it's because Jesus is the Father on the one side. Yeah, is he separate from him as well? Yeah, but why can't I go, okay, Jesus is the Savior, God is the Savior, yeah, Father's the Savior? It's because they're the one person. You know, God is the Father, Jesus is the everlasting Father, it's because there, there's only one Father. Jesus is the Father. You know, so it's not that I'm denying that. It's because I understand it in light of both. And I accept both. Right? So it's not that you're rejecting one or rejecting the other. So it's like, how many fathers are there? How many king of kings are there? How many lord of lords are there? How many saviors are there? How many only potentates are there? How many, who, how many people only have immortality? Well, if you understand it this way, then all three of them have to. All three of them dwell in you. All three of them do this. There's always three doing it simultaneously. And I just feel like, well, how many times do I need to show you that there's only one of thing and then you say there's three of them and it's like, I, I just think it's more reasonable to, to say it's because they're one person on that side. So people will say, well, ah, it's because you're, you're an idiot because, you know, obviously Jesus is seen. So, you know, 1 Timothy 6 can't be talking about Jesus Christ not being seen because people saw Jesus. So you're an absolute idiot thinking that Jesus is not seen. Well, I would answer it this way. Um, let's go on to the next topic. No man has seen the Father? Question mark, right? People say, you know, don't you know that it's the Father that hasn't been seen, but Jesus has been seen? So how can Jesus be the one that is seen and unseen? Well, my question to you is, are you so sure that the Father's not been seen, even though the Bible teaches that no man has seen the Father? Did you know that you know, I think somebody pretty important in John 14 said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So let's just look at those verses because it, it gets a lot deeper than just John 14. But look at John 1.18. It says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now, is that God in that verse talking about the Father? Yes, I think it's pretty clear. 
that it's saying here that no man has seen the Father at any time, and the only begotten Son, Jesus, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared it. Now, do I agree with that? Yes, because there's the three on the Trinity side. But we also have to understand it on the one side, right? Because that one side doesn't go away, and we're trying to figure out how that equal sign works. Well, look at this. So we say, if somebody just says, ah, oh, you know, you're an idiot, because can't you see nobody's uh, say, ever seen God the Father and people have seen Jesus? Well, like I said, we go to John 14, right? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, look at this, ye know him, who the Father, and have seen him. So, I mean, that's what Jesus said, right? He's not saying you've just seen an image of him. He's saying you've known my Father, you've seen my Father. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So people will say, well, Jesus is not actually saying they're just seeing the Father. They'll say, Jesus is just saying you're seeing an image of the Father because he was the image of the invisible God. You're not seeing the first person of the Trinity, you're seeing the second person of the Trinity. And then they'll go to verse 10, right? So that's why I left verse 10 in there because I want to address this. Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? So you see, there's the distinction. Amen. I agree that there's a distinction, right? That somebody's dwelling in the light, but then the light is also that person and, you know, it's all mixed, it's all mixed up there because how does that equal sign work? It says, Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Now, some people will just write that off and just say, well, see, there's a distinction, so therefore you didn't see the Father. And they say, well, the Holy Ghost is dwelling in you, but you're not the Holy Ghost. And I agree with that, right? But can I say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Holy Ghost? No. Can I say, the Holy Ghost dwells in me? And guess what? I dwell in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I can't say that, right? I'm not dwelling in the Holy Ghost. But Jesus is saying, I dwell in the Father, the Father dwells in me. So there's obviously a difference in that dwelling that is that is in Jesus than the Holy Spirit dwelling in me because I can't say if you've seen me, you've seen the Holy Ghost, right? So Jesus is saying here though that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. So that already, at that, that point, it's already Jesus going against this, you know, people just saying you're an idiot if you think you've seen God the Father. Well, Jesus, it was Jesus calling, uh, who is he talking to? Thomas, right? Philip. I mean, when Jesus is talking to Philip and just saying, you're an idiot, Philip, you can't see the Father, you can only see me. No, no, it's, he's, he's saying to him, hey, you've seen the Father, if you've seen me. But it gets deep, deeper than this, right? And this, this is the verse I feel people just brush over, right? Because this is a verse that says, not that any man hath seen the Father, save he that is of God, he hath seen the Father. Now, how do people like, try to explain this one away? Well, that's talking about Jesus. He that is of God is Jesus, only Jesus has seen the Father because you're an idiot if you think you've seen the Father, right? That's how they try and explain it, right? He that it, well, why don't we compare Scripture with Scripture and see who is he which is of God? Is it just clear as day that that's Jesus Christ? Well, but the Bible says here, he which is of God hath seen the Father. So we can, if we can figure out who is he that is of God, then we know who's seen the Father, Right? Now, what verse does that make you think of when you hear, like that says, he which is of God. There's a very famous verse that's been used in this debate. He that is of God. He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Now, is that just talking just about Jesus Christ? No, that's talking about believers. It's us. You know, we are of God. And that's not the only passage, right? So I don't know where they're just writing off this verse by just saying only Jesus is the one that's seen the Father, because... You know, it's saying, he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. We are of God, that hear God's word. Not only that, I mean, let's look at other ones. First John, First John 4. Ye are of God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. So there's ye are of God, little children, we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. That lines up with John 8, 47, doesn't it? He that is of God, heareth God's word. Ye are of God, we are of God. Jesus said, he which is of God hath seen the Father. 
So people think it's silly to think Jesus can be invisible yet visible at the same time. Is it silly to believe that the Father can be invisible and yet visible to us? We've seen him somehow. But people will you know, still say, I'll, uh, I'll just show you some other things. Uh, it says, you know that he was manifest to take away our sins and in him is no sin. We talked about that at the beginning. Jesus is the Father. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him what's the implication there that if you don't sin you can see the father right but then we also read in uh first john 3 uh verse 5 it says uh is that the passage i was going to Who's uh, this one first john 3 8 he that committeth sin is of the devil for the devil sinneth from the beginning for this purpose the son of god was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil look at this whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin so remember we had the passage here saying whosoever sinneth hath not seen him so therefore who doesn't sin has seen him right because whosoever sinneth has not seen him but whosoever has not sinned has seen him and then in john 3 also teaches that whosoever is born of god doth not commit sin for his seed remaineth in him and he cannot sin because he is born of god and it says here and we know that whosoever is born of god sinneth not but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know, like we said before, that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, doesn't this all line up to say that, hey, somebody's seen the Father, it's he which is of God, and ye are of God, we are of God, and because we are of God, we sin not. Those that sin don't see the Father, but those that, uh, those that sin don't see the Father, but those that don't sin, they can see the Father. Now, somebody might keep saying, yeah, 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 but don't you get that you're not actually seeing the Father? You know, you're just, you're just seeing Jesus. I know it says that you've seen the Father, and I know that you of God, and he which is God has seen the Father, but like, don't you get it? It's, yeah, God's, God the Father is invisible. Jesus is the one you're seeing. You're just seeing the image of the Father, right? That's what they say. They're just like, you don't get it. You're seeing the image of the Father. You're not actually seeing the Father. So you're only seeing the second person of the Trinity, not the first person of the Trinity. Now look at what it says here in John 15. John 15 verse 22. He says, He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But look at this. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. Now, if, if we just are meant to just understand all those scriptures in light of we've only seen Jesus but we haven't actually seen the Father, but we're only seeing the Father because we saw Jesus. Why is Jesus saying here, you've both seen and hated both me and my Father, if we're only seeing one person? I don't know. This is why I like when I talk to Kev, I'm saying, I don't really know because I'm not trying to be dogmatic about this. I'm just trying to say that that equal sign that is meat is not as clear cut as people think it is. Right? This is, this, is, this is strong meat of the word that not everyone comprehends. And I'm just showing you these overlaps can't just be explained by the three. It's the one, two, and how it hangs together. I'm not too sure. But somehow it hangs together because the Bible teaches both. Right? Remember, milk is three, milk is one, but meat is the equal sign. Let's go on to another one. I'll show you. It just gets deeper. One spirit, right? There's one spirit. I think Dominic Davis did a pretty good job on this, you know, talking about the one spirit. Ephesians 4, no doubt, there is one body, one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. Look, one Lord, right? So there's one Lord of Lords, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So this is why it's hard to just understand all the Bible just on the three side. Because like I said, if you say there's a Lord of Lords and you say, well, they're both Lord of Lords, Ephesians 4 said there's only one Lord. If they're both God of gods, Ephesians 4 says there's only one God. If there's two everlasting fathers, Ephesians 4 says there's only one Father that is above all and through all and in you all. Right? But it also says there is one Spirit. Now we would understand that that one Spirit is the Holy Spirit. That is the one Spirit that it's talking about. But is it as clear cut as that? Is it as clear cut as there's just this Holy Spirit that's nothing else and then there's the Father and then there's the Son and that's the only Spirit? No, no, it's, it's not as clear cut as that. Let's have a look. John 4 says here, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. Now I've had people tell me where the Bible says, 
nowhere does it tell you to worship the Holy Spirit. Well, if there's one Spirit, right, and that's the Holy Spirit, and then here it says, the Father wants worship in spirit and truth, and then it says, God is a Spirit, talking about the Father in the, in the passage before, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, is there two Spirits now? You know, is God the Father a spirit as well as the Holy Spirit? Or is it that they're, that they're also... I, I, don't want to, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not saying that there isn't three, right? Because I do believe that they're all spirit. But what I'm getting at is that's not all there is. There's also one spirit, which is all of them, right? And that's the one spirit that's talked about in Ephesians 4. This is the one spirit that is receiving worship. And this is the spirit that is being called the Father. 2 Corinthians 13. This is where Paul's writing. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, so who's speaking through him? Jesus Christ, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. So Christ spoke through Paul. 2 Corinthians 13, he says, Examine yourselves. <clears throat> Whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves? How that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates, but I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. So we have the Father who is above all and through all and in you all. We have the Holy Spirit who indwells us. The Bible tells us there's one Spirit, but we also have Jesus Christ dwelling in us. And the Bible says if Jesus Christ is not dwelling in you, you're, you, know, you could be a reprobate, right, if Jesus Christ is not dwelling in you. 1 Peter 1, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come. So he's talking about the Old Testament prophets prophesying of Jesus Christ coming. But look at this, searching what or what manner of time. Now get this, this is the Old Testament prophets. They don't know who Jesus Christ is yet. That name's not revealed until the New Testament. But the New Testament, 1 Peter says, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them, that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. So there's interchangeably saying they spoke with the Spirit of Christ, they spoke with the Holy Ghost. Now I've heard an answer where people say, well, the Holy Ghost just has a name that is the Spirit of Christ, but it's not Jesus Christ. We'll address that in a moment. Sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Now, we know that the Bible is spoken by the Holy Ghost. Why? Because in 2 Peter 1, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, you have, like I said, the Father that's dwelling in you. You have the Father is a spirit. You know, God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You have Jesus Christ, who's the spirit of Christ dwelling in you. Know ye not that Christ, Jesus Christ is in you except, except you be reprobates. And then you have the spirit of Christ speaking the Old Testament. And the, the, the Holy Ghost is the one that speaks God's word. Now, if I only understand it on the three side, am I going to say that it's just because all of them are spirit? There are three spirits. Well, that goes against what Ephesians 4 says, that there is one spirit. Right? So there's one spirit who's all three of them, right? Because there's one and three, you know, how does this meat hang together? Well, look here in Mark 13, and when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Then you compare that to Luke 21, and we can see it's the same passage, but before all these things they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues. And I'll just skip down to verse 13, and then Jesus says here, For I will give you a mouth and wisdom, which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay nor resist. And then in Matthew 10 it says here, But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak, for it is not ye that speak, look, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So what's my point in this, this whole, these whole verses here? Is that there's one Spirit, right? Now, if there's one Spirit, but we only interpret these passages in light of the three side of the Trinity, we're left to conclude that there are three Spirits, right? There's a three Spirits dwelling in us. 
There's three spirits speaking through us. There's three spirits that are talking through these men when they're delivered up, you know, in the end times, who, who this is. You know, it might be us, it might be other people. Or do we believe the Bible when it says there's one spirit and they're all the same spirit and in one sense they're all the same person but in another sense there are three that are spirit but they're not completely separate because like I said, the equal sign, the three doesn't get rid of the one and the one doesn't get rid of the three. We have to understand both but this is where now we're dealing with the meat of the word right we're dealing with the meat look at this one this one's all over the shop i've shown you the guys this one before i want to go back here but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit that's the holy spirit right if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you i don't think anyone would deny that the spirit of god that, that spirit is talking about is the holy spirit now if any man have not the spirit of christ he is none of you so people will say, well, the Spirit of Christ is just another name for the Spirit of God, for the Holy Spirit. But look at, look at what it keeps going. It says, and if Christ be in you, so is it just the Spirit of Christ? And he's saying, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is life because of righteousness. Look at this. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, whose Spirit is this now? Spirit of the Father, right? Dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit, whose spirit, the Father's spirit that it's talking about, that dwelleth in you. So are we indwelled by three spirits? Are there three spirits that are all God? Or is there one spirit? You know? Well, it's both. Right? Because there are three that are one. Right? So I'm not making the case, like I said, just for one. I'm making the case that there's an equal sign there and they're both true. But like I said, it's not... You know, I guess I'm arguing against the three because that's, that they're the people that are drawing the line so hard and I'm trying to make the point that you can't draw this line so hard because the equal sign is there and just showing that they're three doesn't get rid of the one. Again, remember, the milk and the meat, right? So is this passage saying that Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost? You know, because it's used interchangeably. Is the Holy Ghost the Spirit of the Father when there's only one Spirit? You know, these are the questions that we're talking about and... This is why I say, well, I don't 100% sure know how that works, but I'm happy to have this discussion. It begs the question on how that equal sign works, how this meat in the middle actually works, because I see three, and I see one, right? But if somebody just says it's so obviously three, I'm saying, well, that doesn't debunk the fact that they're one, and if somebody just shows me, oh, there's one spirit, yeah, but that doesn't debunk the fact that there's the spirit of the Father, spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Somehow these things hang together, and this is what this meat is. People have difference of opinions. People have, you know, but I just think it's foolish to just draw these hard lines on things that are not that easy. They're not that black and white. And I'm just showing you again. It's not that, it's not this. Now let's, let's just cover the last one. The last one I want to cover is, what is the name of the Father? Right? This is the one that's getting all controversial now. What is the name of the Father? Now I'll answer this with a question, right? What is the name of the Father? People want an answer from me? I'll answer this with a question. Let's first go to Ephesians 4. Right? Ephesians 4. It says here in Ephesians 4 verse 7, But unto every one of us is grace given according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So it's talking about Jesus Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now who is this that's ascending and descending? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. So Jesus Christ is the one. John 3, no man hath descended up to heaven, but the Son of Man which is in heaven, right? So Jesus Christ is the one that ascended and descended into the lower parts of the earth. That's why we believe he went to hell, right? And then he ascended up to heaven and it's the same one that was descended. That's Jesus Christ. So people want to know, like, hey, what's the name of the Father? Well, who's the one that ascended and descended? Now answer this question for me. Proverbs 30 verse 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? Remember, all things were created by him, Jesus Christ, and not anything made that was made by him was not anything made that was made. But look at this. What is his name and what is his son's name if thou canst tell? That's a, that's a pretty hard question, right? Because people are saying, well, the, the name, then Jesus Christ is just the name of the son. Well, Jesus Christ is the one that ascended and descended 
And the question is asked here, hey, somebody's ascended and descended and made all things. What's his name and what's his son's name? Well, we know his son's name is Jesus, but this same one is the one that ascended and descended. Are you going to say that that's the father that ascended and descended and then use Ephesians 4 and say, well, the father went to hell? The father descended and went to hell and then he ascended? No, Jesus Christ did. So in one sense, that's what it's saying, that the name of the father, I believe that is talking about Jesus Christ. What is his name? It's Jesus. What is his son's name? It is Jesus. Now that makes sense to me on the side of the one. Now let's talk about this a bit more. Um, so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's this clear cut. Let's go to John 17. John 17, it says, Jesus here is praying to the Father and he says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Jesus says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. So Jesus is praying to the Father and he says, I've manifested thy name unto the people here. So people are asking me, right, what's the name of the Father? Well, my question to you is, well, what's the name that he manifested? I mean, is there any other option? Is there any other reasonable option? This is why I'm saying I'm not 100% sure, but it, to me, there's only one option out there. That's Jesus Christ. Because people will say, well, the Father was a name. The Father could, but they already knew that name. Because if you look, I don't know if I have it in my notes. I don't think I have it in my notes, but it's, uh, it's Isaiah. Where did I put it? No, there's another one where uh, it says, you know, God, thou art our father. So they already, oh, here it is, Isaiah 64, 8. So I, I, didn't, I forgot to put it in my PowerPoint, but um, Isaiah 64, 8 is where they already knew that God was the father. So that's not a new name that's got manifested when Jesus Christ came. So what is the name that he's manifested to them, that he's declared unto them? The only name that we know in the New Testament that is new to us is the name of Jesus Christ. He says later on in the chapter, O righteous father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, I understand that that doesn't clearly say it is Jesus. I'm just saying, I don't know what other option there is. It's like Proverbs 30 verse 4, right, when we said here. Like, does that say that the name of the Father is Jesus? No. That's why I'm not that dogmatic about it. But if you ask me, who do I think that what do I think the name is of the one that ascended and descended? And what's his name and what's his son's name? I would say, I think that's Jesus. You know, I, I don't know, because I don't know what other name it could be. And if you don't have an answer, if you don't know what the answer is, well, then maybe the right answer is Jesus, because you don't know what the right answer is. I, I, I don't know how that works. Um, look at this in Zechariah 14.9. This is another meat of the word that people don't deal with, right? And even when, you know, it's funny, because when, when Stephen Anderson was preaching all that Trinity stuff, this is when he had that open Q&A that actually was recorded, but I can't find it anymore. I can't find those Q&As. Because there were some things that... Because this was actually raised. Somebody actually said, hey, what about Zechariah 14.9? And said, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord, look at this, and his name one. Now I've asked people, what do you think that name is? Right? And they say, well, it can't be Jesus. So then what is it? Because God is in that day... Uh, I don't know this... Talking about millennium or the fully end times. I'm not that well versed on it. But there somewhere, there's going to be one Lord and his name's going to be one. Now, what's that name going to be? Now, it would make sense to me that that one name that God has is the name above all names, right? A name which is above every name, that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I mean, if God is going to go by any name when his name is one, wouldn't it make sense that that's Jesus Christ? Because it's the name above all names. And then yet people will say, well, no, wait, wait a second. Because in Revelation 3.12, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I'll write upon him my new name. So it's like, no, 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 wait a second. No, the Lord's going to be one. It's going to have one name. But it's not the name of Jesus, the name of all names. There's a new name that we don't know about. That's the name we're going to call Jesus by. Um, we're going to call God by. So it's like, okay. But then how do you explain that in light of Ephesians 1? Where Ephesians 1 says, What she wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Look at this. And every name that is named. So Jesus is above every name that is named. But look at this. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. 
So when God is being referred to as one name, he's being referred to, you know, Je I'm saying Jesus is a name above all names, not only in this world, also in the world to come. But somebody expects me to believe that God wants us to call him by a lesser name for all eternity. Because it's a new name that we don't know, but what we do know is the name of Jesus is above all names, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Amen. So, I don't know. You know, like I said, it's, uh, we're talking about the meat of the word here, right? So in the one sense, do I believe that the name of the Father is Jesus? Yes. But in the three sense, do I acknowledge that Jesus is one of the three and it's not the name of the Father? Yes. Because it's because it's both, and I just try to figure out how this equal sign works. How you know? And my question is, well, does someone have a better explanation? You know, because if somebody's going to be dogmatic about, oh, you know, you can believe the name of the Father, Je Jesus is the Father. But you can't believe the name of the Father is Jesus. Then my question is, well, can you explain some of these verses to me then? Because you're taking this hard stance, but you have no answers to any of this, any, any of this meat. And you keep going on about how it's milk, it's milk and milk, don't you get it? And it's like, does this sound like milk to you guys? No. Does this sound like it's just so easy to comprehend when it just like seems all over the place? Like, to me, this is not milk. I mean, if people that have believed and read and preached the Bible for years are still saying, hey, this is pretty hard to get your head around, I would think twice before you start calling this stuff milk, right? So, do I believe, therefore, that there are three Jesuses? No. Right? That's a straw man. You know what a straw man is? A straw man is when you say, this is what you believe, and then you hit the straw man, and you're like, you're wrong. It's like, no, because I never believed that. I don't believe there's three Jesuses. I believe there's one Jesus Amen. who's all three. Right? I don't, so, so people say, like, well, if you believe the name of the Father is Jesus, then you've got three Jesuses. Well, let's be consistent for a bit, because you believe the Father's God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit's God. But if I said to that person, you believe in three gods, you're a polytheist, they'd go, no, 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 I don't believe there's three gods, I believe there's one God, it's all three, right? But when you say the name of the Father is Jesus, they say you believe in three Jesus, no, 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 I don't believe in three Jesuses, I believe there's one Jesus who's all three. Because I, cause it's not that because I believe the three side, therefore I get rid of the one side. The one side's still there. And that's my point, right? So does it, mean, does it mean I believe there are three Jesuses and this is of Antichrist? No, that's a straw man. I don't believe there's three Jesuses. Um, you know, you know why, why are we only allowed to understand the name of God on the three side, right? It's like, you know, you can only understand the name of God in light of the three. I'm not allowed to understand the name of God in light of the one. Remember, I don't believe this. I don't believe this either. This is what I believe, right? And the equal sign is meat. So like I said, even in the Orthodox Trinity, we don't say that they believe in three gods. No, they believe one God that is all three. And I believe it works the same way. Now, are there still three persons where Jesus is one of the three on this side? Yes. Am I pointing the right side? This side. Sorry, it's, it's this side on my screen. Right? So, this side. so Jesus, is there still a side where Jesus is three and he's one of the three, yes. But is there a side where Jesus is all three? Yes, as well, right? So that's why I think it's both. And that's why I think, like I said, I'm not dogmatic about this because I understand that there's not just this clear scripture that says it. But when I show you these verses, right, and I show you why I believe Jesus is the Father, why I think it's plausible and reasonable and scriptural to assume that the name of the Father is Jesus, and then somebody says to me, well, they don't know the answer to these scriptures, but that's not true. I'm going to go, well, we'll come back when you have an answer because, you know, that's, that's what the position I'm going to take until somebody has a better answer for me. So how does that work? How can Jesus, how can Jesus be the name of the Father yet not the Father at the same time? That way, right? Jesus Father, not the Father at the same time. I don't know. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about, the meat of the word. This meat is not as clear-cut as you think it is. That's the point of my sermon. The point of the sermon is not just to teach you dogmatically that there's one or there's three. The point of this sermon is to show you, hey, there's three and there's one, and somehow these hang together. And it's not as black and white as people make it is. So what I want you to take away from this sermon is, you know, this concept of the equal sign and how the three are one, this is a meat 
This is a strong meat of the word. It's not just milk, right? Three is milk, one is milk, but the equal sign is not milk. It's strong meat because it's not that there are three or one. It's that there are three and one at the same time, right? Both are true of God. And you need to remember, you know, that like I said, whilst three and one are the milk of the word, three equals one is not milk. It's strong meat. And most people, if they're honest with themselves, would admit that they haven't fully got their head around this, that they haven't fully comprehended it. And I would include myself in that group of people. You know, so if you're wondering why I say things like, well, I'm not 100% sure, because I don't claim to have fully comprehended the nature of God. I just see that there are three and there are one, and somehow the three equal one. 